A portrait of Baron de Hirsch hung in thousands upon thousands of homes because people saw in his message and in the work he had tried to do a hope, a dream, a sense that someone cared. Born in 1831 and raised by his prominent family in a German Jewish community, Baron Maurice de Hirsch moved among nobility. After an elite education in Brussels, 17 year old de Hirsch entered into the family business, banking. While the young Baron amassed wealth in Europe, his fellow Jews in Russia were enduring significantly different circumstances. The Pale of Settlement was a vast, desolate tract of land in western Russia where Jews were confined in poverty and persecution. In 1910, the Pale was home to 5.6 million Jews, 40% of the world's Jewish population at the time. In the Pale, bribery, harassment, military conscription, forced conversions and pogroms were common. The Tsar's plan? Destroy all Jewish life in Russia. Meanwhile, Baron de Hirsch expanded his fortunes, pioneering, in cooperation with the Ottoman Empire, the creation of a railroad from the Near East to Europe. It was this venture that gave him the moniker Turkin Hirsch. It also opened his eyes to the desperate plight of his fellow Jews and a unique solution to their problem. I shall try to make for them a new home in different lands, where as free farmers on their own soil, they can make themselves useful to the country. My own personal experience has led me to recognize that the Jews have a very good ability in agriculture. And my efforts shall show that the Jews have not lost the agricultural qualities that their forefathers possessed. However, while Baron de Hirsch was planning to expand his immigration and training programs to aid the Jews of Russia, Theodor Herzl, a journalist in Vienna, was developing his ideas for a national political solution to the Jewish problem. Zionism. In May of 1895, Herzl secured an audience with de Hirsch in his Paris residence to present his ideas. I consider the Jewish question neither a social nor a religious one, even though it sometimes takes these and other forms. It is a national question, and to solve it, we must first of all establish it as an international political problem to be discussed and settled by the civilized nations of the world in council. Palestine is our unforgettable historic homeland. Let me repeat once more my opening words. The Jews who will it shall achieve their state. Herzl's interview with de Hirsch was a failure. De Hirsch insisted emigration was the best solution for the Jews of Russia. Herzl had failed to enlist perhaps the wealthiest Jew of Europe in his cause. De Hirsch established the Jewish Colonization Association and then the Jewish Agricultural Society in the United States to further his emigration plans. My grandfather came here in 1866. Uh, age 10 years old, uh, not speaking a word of English, and landed at Castle Garden. And they had his uh, landing pass. And it, under calling, it says farmer. The bulk of the young Jewish men uh, were farmers. And so they came over here with that background. I think people, you know, non-Jews certainly don't think of Jews as being farmers, but in, in the old country, many of them were. To become citizens here and, and participate in 
the economy of the United States, farming was a great opportunity. But the opportunity was there because of Baron Hirschman providing the seed money so that they could get started. What resulted was one of history's largest and most intriguing acts of philanthropy. De Hirsch's unique ideas and massive resources set in motion a movement that reached across continents and centuries, affecting thousands of lives along the way with some surprising twists and turns. De Hirsch resettled Russian Jews in the Americas, North and South. In South America, many successfully resettled in Argentina. In the U.S., many went to California, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, and other states. Those communities, however, were not always known for their tolerance of Jewish pioneers. Christians who came to America in search of their own promised land may have given their eastern Connecticut towns names right from the pages of the Old Testament, but early on they were apparently leery of the chosen people. Connecticut's early laws clearly reveal resistance to Jewish settlement. It was illegal to give food or lodging to Jews under the early codes of Hartford and New Haven. The Royal Charter explicitly denied Jews the right to build synagogues, worship as an organized group, purchase land for a cemetery, vote or hold public office. In fact, not until 1843 were Connecticut Jews allowed to settle and worship openly. New York and Rhode Island welcomed Jews, communities that supported the American Revolution. George Washington even visited Touro, Rhode Island and was warmly welcomed by the Jewish community. Washington wrote a memorable and important response to the congregation affirming freedom of religion in the new country. He quoted a biblical verse Everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree, and there shall be none to make him afraid. But Connecticut still did not allow Jews to settle and organize a congregation until the mid-19th century. Although de Hirsch's plan ultimately proved as rocky as the farms of Connecticut, where many of the Jewish immigrants settled, de Hirsch's impact was undeniable. Jews would eventually make up nearly 50% of some of these same rural towns, changing the cultural landscape forever. Jewish farms grew to be a significant market for farm supply companies. These firms took out ads in the Federation of Jewish Farmers' Almanac. The ads appeared in both English and Yiddish in order to attract the growing Jewish farm community. The earliest and most active of all the de Hirsch agricultural colonies in Connecticut in terms of written mortgages was the small but vibrant community known as the New England Hebrew Farmers of the Emanuel Society. Agudis Achim, which in Hebrew means an association of brothers, was the name of a small enclave of Russian Jewish immigrant families that were organized by my great-great-grandfather, Hirsch Kaplan, a whiskey merchant and a rabbi from Peryaslav, the Ukraine, and he had arrived with his family in New York in 1888. Two years later, in 1890, probably enticed by the de Hirsch Fund agent, Max Polsky, Kaplan and his group decided to leave Brooklyn, New York for inexpensive Yankee farmland in Chesterfield. The industrious group immediately started small farms, growing vegetables, raising chickens, milking cows, and they would gather together to pray in Kaplan's farmhouse. And he also started a cottage business where pre-cut fabric was stitched together and then carted to New London and shipped to New York as whole vests or jackets or pants or suits. And there were other families who also stitched wallets and suspenders in their homes. My father was in the Russian army fighting Japan, and they traveled back and forth. And they made him a blacksmith, a horseshoer, and other blacksmith work that had to be done. And after a couple of years, I guess, he decided enough was enough and uh, got passage for 
America. They came right to Chesterfield. I think my father knew somebody there. But everybody was poor and everybody worked hard. We had a big farm. We had 150 acres or more. We had a nice garden right behind the store, my Julius Captain store, very and father used to grow his corn, his beets, whatever we needed in the house. We also had cattle, two or three cows. We had chickens. And as far as having a lot of money, we didn't, but we had a lot of food. Never went hungry. Never needed anything. The De Hirsch Fund contributed to help build what became Connecticut's first rural synagogue. It was a one-room wooden structure with Victorian sunbursts above the windows and fish scale shingles below. The New England Hebrew Farmers Ledger and Minutes book, which is a collection of handwritten entries, all in Yiddish, dating from 1892 until 1920, contains the formal constitution and the bylaws that the society adopted in 1894 which called for meetings to be held in Yiddish and spells out the parliamentary procedure for their elections, for rules of membership, fines for synagogue misbehaviors, and a method of adjudicating disputes among members. It was, though, a very difficult life that they had chosen for themselves. Farming was new to many of them, and consequently, many left Chesterfield. My parents came from Russia. I was born in this house March 28, 1919, and I've been here all my life so far. And uh, I've been at the, at the farm. I, I graduated high school in 36, and I've been at the farm every day of my life. They started this farm with one cow and a flock of chickens and um, raised four children here. And of course, my father was the youngest of the four children, and then he was married and uh, raised three children here. A century ago, the Himmelsteins were the Jewish pioneers of Lebanon, Connecticut. Lebanon here, there was 35 different Jewish families. And uh, there was no, there was, we were the only Jewish people on this street. My dad, Sam Friedman, came to the United States in the 1890s with, with his mom and other brother because during the night in Russia on the Polish border, the cloppers came and took their oldest brother during the night to serve in the army, disappeared, and the family realized that the other boys would go too. So immediately, the mother and the son two sons immigrated to the United States and they were apple pickers and berry pickers. I think my father was probably six because he started school. Colchester grew to become the largest Jewish farming community in Connecticut. Between 1881 and 1924, nearly two million Eastern European Jews arrived in the United States in search of a better life. Most of them disembarked in New York City. My father came to America in 1907 from a little town in Beersad, Russia. Settled in New York, where most Jewish people settled at that time, because they ran away from the pogroms that they had in Russia. They fled Russia's hardships, but faced new challenges in the teeming New York tenements. By 1903 in the Lower East Side of New York City, there were more than 1,100 people per acre, and it got worse. Numerous ailments prevailed around the turn of the century on the Lower East Side of New York City. Disease from immigrant ships, lack of code enforcement, and constant fear of fire made life intolerable. From the youngest to the oldest, they were shut in cramped rooms, forced to live in substandard conditions. For those living in city squalor, a mortgage for a farm was the ticket they needed. De Hirsch's financing of farm purchases held an irresistible promise of open lands and endless possibilities. With an initial endowment of $10 million and later $30 million more, 
the largest philanthropic gift ever given at the time, Hirsch, through the Jewish Colonization Association, helped Jews resettle in communities, especially agricultural ones. Many Jewish families seized the opportunity that de Hirsch's fund offered, a decision that would take them in directions they never could have imagined. For those Jews who remained in New York City, the Great Depression later gave a new impetus to seek relief and a livelihood on farms in Connecticut. Everything was an adventure. Everything, uh, working with the chickens or working on the garden or working with the hay. It, uh, we were young and strong and uh, we didn't mind it at all. Clara's family left New York after losing everything in the Depression. With the help of de Hirsch, they bought a farm in Basra. Clara's husband's family also bid city life goodbye. Years earlier, they too received de Hirsch's assistance to find their way to Connecticut soil. He came up by ship from New, to New London from New York. Uh, I don't remember what the name of it was, but that ship also carried not only human beings, it carried cattle, horses, and whatnot. They bought this farm in Lebanon on East Haven Turnpike and Partners in 1913. And uh, of course they had uh, about uh, maybe 15, 16 cows and a pair of horses and, uh, you know, simple farming implements. I uh, learned to milk a cow, so I guess I used to milk one or two cows. Of course, my father made sure the ones that I milked were friendly. They didn't lift their feet, you know, and put them into the pail. While the early Jewish farmer immigrant experience was typical, the influx of refugees caused some anxiety in America. It also, sadly and tragically, prompted a reaction that is reflected in the Dillingham Commission that was appointed in 1907, produced its report in 1911, and ultimately led to some very restrictive laws passed by the United States Congress, a very sad chapter in American history that ultimately created barriers that prevented the victims of the Holocaust and some of their families from coming to this country. These hurdles set formulas and quotas on immigration to this country that were really misguided and tragic and overreaction prompted by political and economic fear, some of the dark side in American history and unfortunately those families that came to live in Connecticut were not followed by the many hundreds, thousands, millions of Jews who could have escaped but for those very restrictive laws that were passed as a result of the Dillingham Commission. The Depression in America was paralleled by horrible economic conditions in post-World War I Germany, leading to the rise of Adolf Hitler and Nazism. Some Jews escaped before being taken captive, but most were trapped and endured the unimaginable horror that followed. The restrictions on immigration to America, as well as restrictions on immigration to Palestine by the British, trapped most of the Jews in wartime Europe. My father did not talk about leaving the country. He said, I am a German Jew. I fought for Germany. I got the Iron Cross, which is a Medal of Honor for fighting for Germany. What can they really do to us? But he couldn't know that they would liquidate us. Henny's father escaped to Shanghai, planning for his family to follow, but Henny and her mother were trapped in Germany and forced into a ghetto and then endured work camps. 2,000 people were trucked away. After one hour, the trucks returned, loaded with coats, shoes, bags with food, bags with, uh, from doctor bags, 
All those people were already in Dünermünde, but Dünermünde was not a camp. It was a mass grave. Henny's mother was not on that transport, but was eventually killed. Later, Henny and her fellow Jews who had moved from ghetto to work camp to prison were finally liberated by Russian soldiers. But we walked out of the prison and met three Russian soldiers. And they told the Russians that we were imprisoned as Jews and you just liberated us. And one of the Russians was, he was a Jew. He broke down. He said, you're the first Jews we liberate alive. Henny's father, by way of the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, went from Shanghai to America. Henny and her family decided to go to America rather than go to Israel. So we decided we to go on a farm. There is a farm in Colchester. So what is Colchester? Where is Colchester? How do you get to Colchester? And we went to Colchester to this guy, to Mr. Berkovich. And he took us around, showed us various farms. And then he showed us a farm where, where I am now. And we talked with, uh, we liked that. And we gave him an offer, but the owner didn't agree. So we went back home. After, I think after two months or so, Mr. Berkowitz sent us a card. Come here, I got the farm for you, for your price. Well, we packed our stuff and went. You know what the farmer told us later? You know why you get the farm? I could get the price, what, you, what, you, what I wanted. But those people came with, his, with their women, left them in the car, and they threw all their orange peel in the yard. And your wife came into the house and said, do you have a garbage pail here for the orange peel? The orange peel gave us the farm. Unfortunately, many of the Jews in America didn't even know what was going on with the Holocaust. Newspapers like the New York Times buried it on page 40 or what have you. So it wasn't frontline news. And then suddenly these people are coming in. Maybe they viewed them as potentially posing some kind of trouble or, or something for them at some point. But they were already integrated into society. We were not treated by, by the dealers that well. One dealer, for our first batch, instead of selling us layers, he sold us broilers, which we did not know. And Mr. Berkowitz comes into the farm and he said, Berkowitz, those are not layers, those are broilers, get rid of them. They will not lay eggs for you. So we had to, right away we had to start with a loss. When we built that house, my father did all the painting because he was a painter. Thirteen years he had with us. I fired him after a while, he was helping in the chicken coop, collecting eggs and, and grading the eggs. And he was breaking too many. I said, Pa, you worked enough, go home. Watch Jenny. <laughs> so he was babysitter. I was born in Russia, in Minsk. And then as a child, my parents migrated to Poland. And there where I lived till the German occupied our territory and I was taken to concentration camp. Gwendo's desperate bravery is what helped her survive the horrors of that camp. People were dead all over. It was near the dawn, a big pile of people. And all of a sudden I hear shots. So I don't know, I sneaked in under a bed and I was slaying. And then it quieted down. So I thought, I'll move out, but it didn't take long, and again they started shooting, and that hit me in my body, and I was bleeding. So I went under, from under the bed, and I let the blood run, and then with my face, I lay down on the blood, and two SS women, came in and said, she, she, take a look, is she dead? And they were standing on me and I hold down my breath. Oh, she said, she is dead. And they went away. Gawendo and survivors like her took their chances in the new world. And just like their predecessors who escaped the Russian pogroms, many of these new immigrants ended up in the tenements of New York City. 
when I saw this place, and they gave already a deposit of five dollars, I don't remember how much it was, so, so I said to Ben, do you expect me to move in here? I was crying like anything, I scrubbed, I washed, I cleaned that a day and a night, thank God we went to bed. We went to bed in the middle of the night, cockroaches, bugs, you name it, I felt like to run back barefoot to, to Europe. This is the way I felt. I said, this is the golden Medina that I came to. Seeking escape, many of these new immigrants turned to the same solution that their predecessors had, Baron de Hirsch. Although de Hirsch himself died years earlier, his assistants lived on with the Baron de Hirsch Fund, established in New York in 1891. Its main goal, help Jewish families escape urban centers and resettle on farmland. If these new farmers were going to succeed, they would need training and assistance. A subsidiary of the Baron de Hirsch Fund, the Jewish Agricultural Society was formed in 1900 to promote farming among Jews in the U.S. The society settled about 4,900 families on farms and extended almost $15 million in loans to farmers in 41 states. Encouraged by this assistance, buying farms became an increasingly popular solution for Jewish families trying to succeed in America. He wrote me a letter and said, uh, should I buy you an engagement ring? And I said, no, let's save it for a cow. In order to finance the buying of this farm, we used the Federal Land Bank and what was called the Production Credit Association and the Jewish Agricultural Society filled the gap that was still there in order so that we could buy this farm. A young Eva Lowe had prior training in agriculture, but many heading to the farms did not. Understandably, for some, this venture into the unknown brought its share of trepidation. He decided he won't buy a farm, and I don't know what a farm is. I never see those. I never see cows, I never see a farm, I never live in the country. I say my husband, I'm afraid, I, I'm not going to go. I'm afraid to go in the country. But to the country they went. Just, I say to just. my husband, you know what, we can't make a living from the cows. Buy me a thousand chicken. And you're going to peddle the egg, the chicken going to lay. You're going to peddle the eggs. You say, I shame. I say, Abby, it's not a shame, please. And I say that this family can say that I want to do, help you to you in a shame. Say I'm going to do this for you. You are the best husband. In the world. You know, can't find a better husband in the world. My husband bought to me. To support the novice farmers, the Jewish Agricultural Society provided professional consultation by the way of people like Ben Miller, who was often in the homes of new farmers throughout Connecticut. Word of mouth was, look, uh, there's this guy Miller who will talk to you. Um, and, uh, and they did, they talked about um, alternatives to what they were doing at the time. My mother was a, uh, working in a sweatshop at the time, my father in a, uh, in a luggage factory, and uh, living in, it was largely a tenement. I mean, it was a pretty depressing, crowded, unattractive place to live. And the story, the opportunity that was uh, presented was, look, you can raise your child in the fresh air, you can have fields, you can have trees, uh, running water, and most important, you can be your own boss. You don't have to be in a factory, you can be charge of your schedule, you can have true freedom. Uh, and this resonated very much, pretty much with anyone that, uh, that spoke to Miller. And so in, in my, ex uh, my family's experience was they passed the hat, they raised a few thousand dollars. And, um, and Miller made available financing and he came, picked them up, drove them to Connecticut uh, drove them to Dan uh, the Danielson area, in our case it was in Moosup, and he showed us a farm that was available, it was a dairy farm at the time, and then brought them to meet two other families. 
uh, who had already settled here. And they were, they were like Lundslight. They, uh, you know, they introduced themselves and they said, look, this is how we live. This is what we do. This is the work. This is how to do it. And we're very happy here. And so my parents said, okay, you know, we're, we're in. Uh, and that's how they settled here. And family after family, Miller just repeated the same thing. The word was he drove this large black car and he would drive the families in from New York, uh, bring them to meet the families who had already settled, show them av an available farm. And now there's another Jewish farmer. Pretty soon by the 52, 53, there was 30 families, 25 families already. Mr. Miller came and he used to take us around and show us farms. And that what we, f he found that farm that we settled on. We were the first farmers settled in Danielson. He explained everything, how the coops should be and how we should do the coops. And we arranged the builders and he was there where we start to build and he was looking in. He used to come a few times a week to look how we pro progress in the buildings. So the farm that we bought was 10,500. Jewish agriculture gave us $6,000. We had some our own money and also from the bank we, we took a loan and we were be able to buy the farm and buy the, the chickens and have money to live on. Building a coop was one thing, but becoming a chicken farmer was entirely something else. I went to pick some eggs from the chickens, so I took a long stick, and I did a stick. I used to pick up the chicken and take out the egg. I was afraid for the chicken, but you learn. Even if Mr. Miller had to teach the farmers himself. <laughs> <laughs> he went in in the coops with us and showed us everything. Mr. Miller is remembered fondly for his generous spirit, providing not only farming tips, but sometimes additional funds from the Jewish Agricultural Society to help the farmers get started, like paying for grain to feed the chickens. And you know, Mr. Miller took out a check over $4,000 and we paid off the gray men and little by little we start selling the eggs and enlarging the farm, taking loans from the banks and building coops, new coops, large coops and repaying the mortgages. We were clear, our farm was clear. After 10 years, our farm was clear. And towards the end, we had, I think, but 20 or 25,000 chickens. The Gwendos were hardworking farmers, a trait De Hirsch made critical to his charitable plan. I contend most decidedly against the old system of almsgiving, which only makes so many more beggars. And I consider it the greatest problem in philanthropy to make human beings who are capable of work out of individuals who otherwise must become paupers. And in this way, to create useful members of society. I would not be standing on this farm had not the Jewish Agricultural Society uh, gave my grandfather you know, part of the loan to, to buy this farm. If de Hirsch thought that work was the measure of philanthropy, then farming was indeed the perfect project. I've worked every inch of this farm. Tedded all the, all the hay, I raked all the hay in the spring and the fall. I harrowed all the fields to get them ready, to get them seeded down in the fall, to put ground cover on so that there wouldn't be any erosion. My dad and, and his brother Ben, and of course is his father and, and the rest of the family, they went through an era where Farming was probably the same as it was for the past 200 years to, to modernizing 
the beginnings of, of modern agriculture. I mean, they were using a, a, a horse to cut the hay or to rake the hay. They were using a sigh to cut the hay by hand at times. So yeah, it was a shift from going from a lot of hand labor to sort of using the machines. And, and it wasn't like you could go into Sears and buy some of these machines. They were cutting ice. The machine they cut with ice, they made themselves. They designed it themselves. They, they used a, uh, a blade that you would normally use to cut wood and they mounted it on a motor and they were literally cutting ice for themselves with the machine they made. So they, were, they built their own hinges, they, 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 built, they did all their electrical work, the carpentry work, my father did his own veterinary work. And they moved these rocks in here as well as all the rocks that are on the edges of this field. They worked pretty hard with a crowbar and some leverage and both of them were probably no more than 150 to 160 pounds soaking wet, probably around 5'4". And the stone was so heavy, they actually had to chain the two tractors together and then have a drag in the back of one of the tractors in order to pull it off the field. Although Baron de Hirsch's own upbringing lacked rural influence, he was convinced that the Jewish people had a natural inclination towards agriculture. To support his belief, he studied the success of the Russian Jews he had helped settle in Argentina. These families, which a few years ago, bending under heavy burdens, appeared to be only wandering tradespeople in Russia, have now become thrifty farmers who, with plow and hoe, know how to farm as well as if they had never done anything else. They lay out their farms in the best manner, and build themselves such pretty little houses that everyone in the vicinity employs them as carpenters in house building. The knowledge of this guides me in my work, and I am now setting out with all my strength to accomplish it. De Hirsch bet his fortune on the theory that Jews would become thrifty farmers, but things didn't always work out as he envisioned. It was a dairy farm. Well, Mr. Weingrad knew from New York going on Sutter Avenue, that radishes, black radishes, were a delicacy. And they sold for like two, three dollars a bushel, even in those days. So Mr. Weingrad, my foster dad, planted an acre of black radishes. And when they became ripe and ready, he put them in a basket and he took them down to our Jewish Chasen grocery store in Willimantic, and he thought he'd sell the, the radishes to Mrs. Chasen, and he, he, he had maybe a thousand or eight hundred bushels of radishes. The whole acre was full of radishes. They're like beets. They look like beets, if you know. And she says, what? I sell a bushel of radishes in one year. I can't sell radishes. So Mr. Weingrad took the radishes and he cut them up and he started feeding them to the cows. But then the, the milk company returned the milk because it made the milk sour. And he lost all that profit from the milk. They wouldn't take his milk, uh, the company in Providence. So that was his great big disappointment right away with the radish. Sour milk, good for pigs, but not for human beings. There are many tales that come out of these farms. Uh, there's the famous story of the man who only fed his horse every other day and was surprised that the horse didn't work very well for him. There was a farmer who had a field of wheat and mowed it several times before finally complaining to the local agricultural agent that the wheat never seemed to get cut. And then the agent went out and discovered he hadn't put knives on the reaper before he mowed it. There was a farmer who was famed for planting a huge fields of onions and then deciding that to stoop over and weed the onions was too much work, so he hired people to weed the fields for him. But he didn't know, and hence didn't teach them the difference between a weed and an onion, and they successfully pulled up all of the sprouting onions and left him a field of weeds. It was a tough life. It was always, next year be better, next year be better. They always, the, the, the farmers were always living in hope. De Hirsch gave to thousands the opportunity for a new home and lifestyle. But what many of these new farmers found in Connecticut was more than they bargained for. These were hardscrabble farms that had ultimately been sold by their last owner because they had been unprofitable and had failed. Um, those who have spent time in these soils know that the one thing that always does grow is stones. 
This unfamiliar and unfit land was a source of constant struggle. Overworked and overwhelmed, some eventually abandoned the farms. There were many instances where a man and his family would try the land for three years or five years or even ten years and finally conclude that, no, this wasn't the life for them. And they would sell the farm. The Baron de Hirsch agents were ever available and would turn the farm over to another Jewish family. There were cases where the same piece of land might be turned over three or four times, each time funded by a Baron de Hirsch fund mortgage as yet another family tackled this difficult, trying land. Yet despite this trying land, some of the farmers persisted, facing the many challenges that beset them. One time, I guess, when uh, my father was away and uh, when the house caught a fire and there were no fire companies around that time and if you couldn't put it out yourself, it was a goner and that's what happened. Our old farmhouse uh, burnt down in the early 30s and then we had a hurricane that came through here and wiped out our barn. 1938 hurricane demolished the uh, chicken coops. We had to go out of business because the hurricane just killed the animals. And it was a beautiful barn, one of the nicest in the area. And the, just, the wind just pulled it over and collapsed on top of the cows. It was a, it was a terrible sight. They had a great loss. Some say that de Hirsch's philanthropy failed, that agriculture wasn't the answer for immigrant Jewish families. Indeed, the Baron's philosophy may have been flawed, but ultimately the ideals of his generosity set something new in motion, innovation. The intrepid Jewish families that remained on their farms found new ways to flourish. All the time we had cows, but when the bomb was wiped out and making a living from cows was pretty precarious, uh, I, I helped uh, tear down the barn and we took the lumber and built our first chicken coop, I believe it was in 1937. So we started into the chicken business. Embracing de Hirsch's gift of the rocky soil, they turned boulders into stepping stones by opening resorts and even dabbling in other more controversial activities. This was the time of prohibition in the United States but there was a dark side to our Jewish brethren and they had to be in the bootleg business. They would have homemade stills like in, in the Ozarks or in Appalachia with the copper kettles, with the two kettles, with the round pipes and they would make moonshine. And this was another income sideline. On the less illicit side, Jewish farmers found other agricultural solutions to the stony soils. The son of a dairy farmer, Mark Wolf secured the success of his farm by pioneering a new fertility process for dairy cows. Of course, it was the chicken business that, for many, presented the most viable, lucrative option. We had a hundred and some acres, and it was a lot of rocks, so there was very little open land. So there was enough, only enough hay for, say, 12 or 14 cows. Well, there was no way in the world that anybody could make a living from 12 or 14 cows. So I decided to go into the poultry business. And then a few years later, I built another coop, and then a few years later, I built another coop. And that we just kept building and building every few years, we'd, or every year, we'd build another building. And that's how we grew. Kofkoff's expansion caused some resentment. There was a lot of animosity towards me because they could see me keep growing and growing and growing. And as I grew, they were going out of business. As far as most fathers, I felt sorry in a way, but in another way, I knew that if I wanted to get big, there was only one way to get big, and that was to buy out other people. But ultimately, 
His success earned him the accolades of the industry. That was quite an honor to be picked as the best of the United States because I think there were like 40,000 uh, farmers, they said at that time, were in the egg business. One of the most popular ways Jewish farmers found to survive was by turning their land into summer resorts. It usually started with just a few relatives, escaping the city's heat for some fun in the country sun. But as the word spread, paying customers brought just the boost that Jewish farmers needed to supplement their often meager agricultural income. In the early 1900s, the Stores Hotel in Stores, Connecticut advertised itself as a kosher hotel within walking distance of the Connecticut Agricultural College where guests could see motion pictures. My mom uh, was the manager of the hotel. My grandmother was chief cook. My grandfather uh, was out questioned, the cigar smoking, pinochle playing social director. I don't think he did much work, but he, you know, he made things interesting. Uh, he bailed, you know, waiters and, and dishwashers out of jail when they got in trouble, and, and he, you know, always had a joke and a cigar for somebody. My Aunt Rose, who I always thought was a little weird, uh, probably did work in the background. I don't think she was ever a waitress because I couldn't imagine her serving anybody. Uh, but she probably made beds or made sure rooms were tidied up. The hotel guests were a lot like family. These were people that came back year after year after year. And, and if you didn't know better, you'd start calling them aunts and uncles. I mean, that's the way it was. At that time, people were uh, very casual. As long as they had a place to swim in, and uh, huckleberries to pick and room for the children to roam around, they were happy. They didn't have to provide any entertainment at all. And so that went on for a number of years. Some of the people would prefer to be fed, and so my mother did provide meals for those. And the others were, as they say, kachalain, and they took care of themselves. They'd go to the cow and take the hot milk right from the cow and drink it. They thought that was the greatest thing. They entertained themselves. They'd go down to the pastures and strip down and get sun. They'd pick blueberries. And they'd go to the lake, maybe. But as the crowds grew, so did the entertainment headlines. When I was growing up, on a summer night, you could stand outside here and listen on a Saturday night, and you would hear sounds from these resorts, you know, Banner Lodge, Grand View, right across the road, Wiener's Hotel, Orchard Mansion, Ted Hilton's, now known as Frank Davis, and all these big resorts, and you would hear all the, the sounds that people would be making on Saturday night or Friday night. Pool sounds early in the evening, loudspeakers, people making announcements, lots of laughing. And it was amazing, you know, that in this country area you heard all of that. And Muda said one time, I think in the 1950s, it peaked with over 50 resorts. Many of them were Jewish. All of them were started, I think, by farm families, country families, that took in first friends and relatives and then paying customers. It was quite the thing for local people to do. And, and the talent that came was Broadway talent at the time. Um, you know, television started in the late 40s, early 50s, so the early television stars would come. Zero Mistel was Jack Banner's first cousin. And this farm, my, my parents' farm in Banner Lodge, there was some ownership by the Mistel family, I think. And, uh, but they, be, they remained very close. And even when uh, Zero was at the, the peak of his popularity with Fiddler on the Roof, uh, he would come up uh, several times a summer and do a show, and it was always a big sellout. It might have been the largest resort in the state. It, it was a, a fantastic success um, in the years that uh, it existed, which were really, I think Jack Banner started it in, in the 1930s on, on a farm that his father, uh, Sam, or Pop Banner, uh, had bought with, I believe, a Baron de Hirsch grant. As the popularity of the resorts grew, the Jewish populations of many Connecticut towns increased. At the height of Banner Lodge's popularity, Jewish crowds in Moodis might not have raised an eyebrow, but years earlier, influxes of Jewish farmers caused concern with some in power. 
so they used to go around oh, mimicking Kojitki, Jitki, and uh, especially Polish people were very uh, antagonistic and anti-Semitic. Yes, we, we counted a lot of that, but we overcame it. I didn't know the difference between Jews and non-Jews, uh, really. Uh, uh, my, my best friends were not Jews, because there weren't that many Jews, but I do remember in the fourth grade when I was walking home from school on, on Halls Hill, and he, he wasn't very nice to me. I knew that the, some non-Jews didn't like Jews because he called me Dirty Jew. And on the way home, he pulled me my ponytail one last time, and I beat him up, and I ripped his shirt off. And I ran home crying that I beat up, and he's poor, and I ripped his shirt. And my father said, good, good. He'll never do that again, and none of the boys are going to do it again to you because you can beat them up. My father went, was elected to the state legislature in, in Hartford, Connecticut, two times for two terms as a Jew. And, and he went and he was elected and there weren't enough Jews to elect him. The Republican leaders th saw him as a likely good candidate, a good guy, handsome with red hair and liked people. And so they elected him. He worked very hard. He electioneered very hard. And they had a family who went out and got voters, probably. The Daughters of American Revolution gave an award every year at the high school. And lo and behold, I was awarded the award. And here's my pin. I've even got it. I was 16 years old in 1949, and I got the award. I was the first Jewish girl to get the award. Miss Day told me that. She said, Rena Bell, you're the first Jewish girl and you deserve it. You are a lady and you will always be a lady and you're going to go to school and get educated and we're going to always be proud of you. So when she told me that, I knew I had to live up to that. Jake Berkowitz, the real estate agent who sold farms to many Jews, not only brought Jews to rural eastern Connecticut, but also helped African Americans settle there. He was an all-inclusive guy, and he did some blockbusting. He was probably one of the original blockbusters, because Schuster's Express was one of the largest, I would say, employers in Colchester. Huge trucking company, 18-wheelers. I think they covered from Maine to Florida, up and down the East Coast. And they started hiring black drivers. And there were areas where the black drivers couldn't, um, they weren't welcome in some of the neighborhoods in the housing. And my grandfather put him in, one way or the other, and he helped a lot of families. Mr. Fletcher drove for Schuster's Express. His kids all went through Bacon Academy. Um, I've been close to them. We've all been close to them for years. And uh, my grandfather got them into their first home. And I, I'm not certain that the neighborhood was that welcome, but one way or the other, he got them in. He, he helped integrate them. By and large, the Jewish refugees from World War II did have a good reception in rural Connecticut. Talk came to uh, what do we do now because there are so many of us, you've got children, we need a Hebrew school, we need a place for services, we can't do this thing at people's homes anymore. Um, so they decided, look, it's time to build a temple. And the issue was, well, you know, where do we raise the money? Because nobody was, was well healed at that point. And uh, someone floated the idea, look, let's reach out to the, the community. And uh, not surprisingly, there was real reluctance to do that because here you have a group of immigrants, mostly survivors of the camps, not terribly trusting of the surrounding community, not terribly trusting of the uh, non-Jewish community and thinking, oh great, here we are, we're a tiny minority in this very Yankee town. They're gonna support us. And uh, the American, the, uh, the Americana uh, said, look, you know, we have a nice relationship with our neighbors here, uh, let's try it. And so they did, they reached out and were very pleasantly surprised because uh, the local churches, um, the businesses, the banks, all were more than generous and delighted with the notion of, yeah, let's, let's support this group of people. They 
deserve a break. <laughs> they deserve an opportunity where there's no question but that they're going to work hard, that they're going to be good citizens. And there was this outpouring of generosity, money, and a real sense of welcome. They had minions in, in people's homes, you know. My father was involved, uh, a bunch of the farmers in Hebron. They built a little synagogue, and it was orthodox. And that's where I went when I was a kid. My father used to walk four and a half miles to go to synagogue on Saturday morning. And they had to be there by 8.30. So you had to milk the cows, feed the chickens, and then walk four and a half miles. Of course, there were a lot of Jewish farmers in the area, and also Polish. We got along with the Americans. And uh, other than that, uh, we never found any problems. I never heard one bad word. We all got along. It was wonderful. Everybody knew we were Jewish, but we didn't talk about it. And we knew everybody else had a Christmas tree. Well, we never thought twice about it. And the people out here were amazingly tolerant. More than tolerant, Jewish and non-Jewish alike truly became rural American farm neighbors in every way. We helped all our neighbors. It, it, it didn't make any difference if they were Gentiles or not. And uh, if their cattle were out, we put them back where they belong. And if the neighbor was sick, we, we milked the cows and, and fed them and took care of them too, just like anybody else. The fire wasn't until 1959, one night in June. Everybody was asleep and I heard the dogs bark. And I looked out the window and the far end of the barn was fully engulfed in flames. We were lucky the cows were out already in the night. We lost two calves. The barn burned all the way. The only thing that's left of it is the old milk house over there. Farmers came from all over to help uh, build up, build the new buildings hammers and, and uh, saws. And not only did they come once, they came for many days, some of them, to put up the new buildings. As de Hirsch said, his hope was to provide his fellow Jews with the chance to truly become citizens in a free society. And indeed in Connecticut, they did. The Second World War started. The Jewish community of, of uh, Columbia and Hebron got together and said, let's do something. So they sponsored to raise money and donate an ambulance. These sections of the report describe some of the personal characteristics of these families who came to Eastern Connecticut. Fascinating reading even today. In general, the Russian Hebrew has proved more apt in civic relations and in commerce than in agriculture. He is likely to become a citizen sooner than most Eastern immigrants, and to take a more intelligent interest in politics, fewer literate, and practically all of the American-born or minors have been in the United States 10 years, and they can speak, read, and write English. The Hebrews have demanded better schools nearly everywhere they have settled. They are not content with the financial returns from the farms they occupy, but they are less content with their educational advantages. Whatever may be said of his agriculture, the Hebrew farmer is a thinking, protesting citizen. Embracing freedom, they established their faith with synagogues. Demonstrating the essence of citizenship, they contributed to local government and education. In fact, the Jewish farmers had become such a part of New England life that during the Cold War, the American government, which years earlier had issued the ethnic investigation, now touted in a Russian language magazine the Jewish farmers' success as a pillar of propaganda against the Soviet Union. And I grew up I thought everybody who was Jewish had a farm, and so that it was nothing out of the ordinary for me to see Jewish farmers. Later in life, I remember people being shocked and in disbelief that there were Jewish farmers. People used to kid me all the time uh, when, when, when they knew I grew up on a farm with that old question, 
What's a Jewish boy doing on a farm? Whether congressman or pilot, the answer most often was that they were descendants of the Jewish farmers who at one time or another braved the stones and the unknown of rural Connecticut. Eventually, new technologies and changing times led to a general decline in farming. The decline of the farmers, because the, Jew, the younger generation got educated, they want to go to high school. They went to high school, then they went to college. They got educated and they didn't care about farming. They could make a better living because farming was seven days a week. Holiday or no holiday, young Kippur or no young Kippur. You got to be there to feed, feed the chickens, feed the cows and uh, milk in them. Not everybody is, is cut out, it has the metal, uh, has the desire to do this type of work, to do this as a vocation. Um, if my sons choose to pick this up as a future, as a, as a way of life, that's fine, that's wonderful. Uh, but uh, uh, there are very few people anymore that are of the uh, train that my children will do as I did. With time, the Jewish population in many of these Connecticut towns began to dwindle. Families moved from the rocky soil to more mainstream city and suburban lifestyles. I had Jewish friends within the community, uh, you know, kids I could hang out with. There were a lot of Jewish farmers in this area. Um, we go to a, this town here as a small school. There were seven Jewish kids in my class. I believe my son is the only Jewish boy in, uh, it's, he's one of two Jewish boys in the entire elementary school system. It was the end of an era. My brother's uh, back went out, and luckily I'm out of session, so I'm able to help him. Uh, but basically we've sold the herd, and this is the end of almost 50 years of operating the farm. The Jewish immigrants of eastern Connecticut who became farmers in our state left a remarkable legacy and heritage. And even today, we feel and sense the incredible benefits that all of our state has reaped from the culture and work ethic and sense of personal pride and morality that they brought to Connecticut. And this paragraph, I think, summarizes some of that heritage and legacy. In some senses, they have raised the social, moral, and educational standards of the settlement. They are ambitious, if pessimistic, and a good many have more energy than some of the native stock. A more or less healthful discontent pervades the communities, but the desire to get on materially leads to more or less shifting and short tenures. Very little race prejudice manifests itself in business or in educational affairs. There is a social race cleavage that is mutually respected and generally observed. And of course, there are no religious affiliations with Gentiles. In general, the Hebrews are respected, especially the early settlers as neighbors and citizens, but the opinion prevails that the majority are not good farmers. Occasionally, some of the family or friends come up and want to see the place, we discourage them because there's no sign of what used to be. But I have memories. When de Hirsch's only son, Lucien, died at age 31, de Hirsch declared, humanity is my heir. He threw himself completely into his philanthropic efforts and ideology. Before his own death, he left his wife, Clara, as the sole administrator of his fortune, knowing that she would further his life's work and legacy. What results are to follow from my philanthropic labors? What I desire to accomplish, what after many failures has come to be the object of my life, and that for which I am ready to stake my wealth and my intellectual powers, is to give to a portion of my companions in faith the possibility of finding a new existence, primarily as farmers and also handicraftsmen, 
In those lands where the laws and religious tolerance permit them to carry on the struggle for existence as noble and responsible subjects of a humane government. Agriculture might not have been the quintessential answer, as de Hirsch had intended. Nevertheless, the farm life he greatly inspired left its impression on Connecticut and on the Jewish families that lived it. After the Great Depression in the 1930s, descendants would return to their families in Chesterfield in order to attend the high holiday services, as I said, but probably only until the late 1950s. Then the synagogue was vandalized and unfortunately burned to the ground in 1980. But there still was this very important and precious legacy that we all wanted to protect. So in 2006, 19 direct descendants signed affidavits and they legally reactivated New England Hebrew Farmers as a not-for-profit religious corporation in the state of Connecticut. With their membership contributions and funding from the Connecticut Commission on Culture and Tourism, the New England Hebrew Farmers of the Emanuel Society Synagogue and Creamery site was named as Connecticut's 24th State Archaeological Preserve in 2007, and then it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2012. To further understand their history, the organization welcomed the University of Connecticut's Archaeology and Judaic Studies Field School dig. The dig methodically excavated the basement of a 1912 dwelling on the site that was used by the shochet, or the visiting ritual butcher and cantor. Interestingly, it still contained a mikvah, a stepped pool used as a ritual bath. In particular, this was largely a community of poor Eastern European uh, Jews, and to go to this expense and build this uh, elaborate, involved structure and to do it in accordance with, uh, with halakha, Jewish law, again, is a testimony to their determination to maintain traditional Jewish life. I loved being on the farm because, you know, I could do what I wanted to, I could go where I wanted to on the farm, because Pop didn't, he didn't drive. There was no money. I had uh, bib overalls that I used to wear as a kid, and there was more patches than there was overall, you know. But it was, it was a nice, clean life. It was, it was a good way to live. It's the lament of every kid that grows up in a small rural New England town that there's nothing to do. But once you leave the town and you grow up and you have a family, you realize that there isn't a better place in the world to raise children or a family than in a small rural New England town. Kids that I grew up with, I know, really have a strong work ethic. And I know from my own personal experience that work ethic has now been passed on to my children. I think it's because of my parents getting the opportunity from the Baron Hirsch Society to, you know, get a new life, a new start, you know, when they came to this country, rather than have to work in the sweatshops in New York City, you know, they got the opportunity to come, you know, out and start a whole new life for themselves. I think it made them very responsible children, very responsible adults, because Farming is, is a very basic thing. You have to have uh, worry about nature and you have to worry about the health of your animals. And uh, you can't just say, well, I won't milk them today or I won't take them here to the pasture today. There's a certain regime that you have to follow. And the kids knew that and they did. And it made them very responsible adults. Not only was farm life a teacher, but in the cases of the Low and Himmelstein properties, the land itself lives on as a forever green land preserve. The state uh, bought the development rights. My dad didn't live to see it, but I completed his wish. The development rights, which we always wanted, really enabled us to save the farm because it was the only way uh, I would be able to pay out the, the, the loan that I had to take to pay out the non-farm relatives. And also what was left was able to uh, you know, help me maintain the farm and preserve some of the farm buildings as well. So it was really critical to the survival of this farm. And to the best of my knowledge, I probably was the last person in the state to receive a Baron de Hirsch, uh, funding from Baron de Hirsch to go to college. I always call myself one of the Jewish, uh, the Jewish last of the Mohegans there. 
if I don't tell the story and if I don't preserve the history, it's, it's going to be lost with me because I'm the last one that had any direct contact with the people that farmed this actively and, and did the work on this farm. So there's been a Himmelstein on this farm for 97 and a half years now. Very, very happy to have been born in this country, in this area, with these kind of freedoms that are nowhere else in the world. Interestingly enough, as patriotic people who were kicked out of their own country, they are the greatest patriots ever. My mom to this day loves a parade and has instilled in us a responsibility that goes along with the freedom, not just the privileges. And I think that has helped us in our personal lives, in our work lives, in the direction we have for the futures we see for ourselves, is that sense of appreciation and responsibility. There's an old Hebrew saying, mitzvah goreret mitzvah. One good deed generates another good deed. In total, de Hirsch gave the largest philanthropic gift of his day and his gifts of hope and opportunity cannot be counted. Through decades and acres, de Hirsch's bygone deeds have reaped a bountiful harvest in the lives of the Jewish farmers who gave their hearts and hands to the land and helped cultivate the very soil and soul of Connecticut.